In some sense, Ron and I, uh, we go back quite a ways, um, not to ACDC, but ASSE, uh, which is not quite as exciting. Um, <laughs> they don't create fireworks. <laughs> um, ASSC, the American Society of Safety Engineers, uh, I think they've tried to call themselves something different recently, but Ron might be able to comment on that um, for a variety of interesting reasons or uninteresting reasons. Um, the um, the uh, the interesting thing about, about well, there's many interesting things about Ron, but uh, one is that he stems from a, um, a, a family of uh, a, a, an important lineage in, in safety practice. Um, However, uh, interestingly, um, when you when you study that a bit further, you see that in that lineage there uh, has been a, a focus and a, a work commitment on helping companies navigate and manage the compliance demands that nowadays are uh, very clearly associated with uh, safety. Um, and so, uh, instead of capitulating to that and saying, "All right, how can I help?" companies manage the compliance burdens associated with safety, um, Ron decided to do things differently and said there must be different ways, better ways to do this. And so his uh, company currently, if I'm not mistaken, Ron, is called Reflect Consulting Group. Um, it very much uh, lives and breathes the scholarship of Safety 2 and Safety Differently um, and all of the ideas that we can easily rally uh, behind together. Um, Ron, um, as I uh, believe, lives in California still, uh, doesn't have COVID, and so <laughs> is, uh, is in a beautiful place to share with us uh, a whole bunch of ideas about the, uh, the applicability of much of what we've talked about today. Ron, I didn't want to make it more specific than that because I wanted to give you as much freedom in this frame as I could possibly do. Over to you. All right. <laughs> I am in California still, and I am 100% COVID free. So all is right with the world. Uh, thank you for that, Sydney. Um, it's good to it's good to see you again. Uh, it's been a while, um, but no. So uh, yeah, thank you all for for having me. This is kind of exciting. Um, so what I want to talk about today is is actually a case study, and um, it's it's something I actually did last week, uh, so it's really fresh in my mind. Um, and when Dave asked if I would speak, I, I decided, hey, let, I could talk about this thing I'm going to do the week before, and I have no idea if it's going to work. And so uh, I'm really really excited to to kind of share what we what we tried uh, with a client of mine and um, yeah, share a little bit about what we learned in it. So I have a a client that I'm currently working with. Um, they're a construction company uh, here in the United States not in California. And uh, they, you know, I've been working with them for a while, trying to help them, you know, increase their ability to learn from the workers, you know, like Dave was talking about earlier, asking workers questions. And like you've heard so many speakers today talk about. Um, but one of the things they wanted to do, and they did this on, on their own, and I was really impressed when they, when they kind of brought me in that, you know, a group of them called me into a meeting and they had this harebrained idea that, you know, they have to do a safety assessment every year um, but they didn't want to do an assessment <laughs> and they wanted to expand the scope and they wanted to, to be more productive because they were sick and tired. They said, and this was super interesting for me, they were sick and tired of the normal like scoring that you get in, in auditing and assessments, you know, like zero to four or the red, yellow, green. And they said there was so much time that was being spent where, you know, they would just be, you know, have the assessors come in and, and the people at the projects would be arguing, no, this is a three, no, it's a four. And, you know, and it just wasn't adding any value at all. And so they, they said they wanted to do something different. And so, so what, what we started talking about is, you know, hey, what if we expanded this a little bit? Because one of the things I've been talking about with them is how do we change the definition of safety away from the normal sorts of things that we look at, you know, uh, pre-task cards or, you know, safe behaviors and things like that. And how do we, you know, e expand the scope to talk about capacity and the capacity to do work? Um, and in talking about that, we, we happened upon this sort of framework that they have within the company. It's their called, they call it their success factors. It's 10 items that they identified that are supposed to predict a successful construction project. Right. And it's, 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 you know, typical stuff that you'd, you'd see, you know, um, good customer relations with the, their, their owners of the sites that they're constructing on, um, you know, good financial planning in terms of margins and contracting, you know, operational planning, um, you know, team engagement and having the right 
construction team on site, good engagement with their contractors, their subcontractors, um, things like that. You know, normal stuff that you would expect. And, and so one of the things we said is, well, why don't we look at that? Because that's your, your model of how you think a successful project should go, like how you're setting up your projects for success. What if we used that as our framework and said, hey, are we doing that? And so rather than as a scoring of a project and saying that this project is or isn't doing well, what if we said, hey, how are we all setting ourselves up for success? How are we setting up these projects for success? Um, and what can we learn from that? Right? And so they, that, that idea kind of resonated with them. And, and so they, they decided that they wanted to, to try it out and you know, they wanted to change the name of it. So they didn't want to call it a safety assessment. So we, we you know, were throwing around names and the name that they landed on uh, for better or worse uh, is Operational Resilience Summit. That's what they wanted to call it. And so the idea was, let's get a group of people from a peer project, um, you know, people who do similar work to a, you know, a given project, and let's also get some people you know, from the design phase, right? People who are in the main corporate office and let's come together to a site and let's ask the question, what's happening, right? What's happening at this job site? What's going on? Um, and then use that to say, okay, what can this tell us about how we are setting our projects up for success and, and you know, creating resilience? And so that's, you know, that was what we did. And we said, hey, let's try this out at a project. Um, so we brought the people together. We had a team of about six or so different people, um, you know, from, from some people from another project that was a peer project, just about an hour up, similar size and scope, um, but also some design people. And, you know, and then we also brought people from the project together because one of the things we didn't want to do is have it be like, hey, we're going to come and assess your project and then we're going to tell you how your project's going. You know, we wanted this to kind of be a co-creation, a co-discovery sort of process. So once we brought everyone together, what we then did is, is we split up into teams and some of us went out into the job site and just went out and talked to craft workers. And the, the stated goal was go out and grab stories about what's going on. So people would go out and ask, hey, what are you working on? What are the challenges that you're seeing? What are the, you know, what are the areas that you think are going really well here? Um, so, you know, again, the scope was not just bad, but good and bad. Um, and then we had also another group that was doing listening sessions with various people. Um, so it wasn't just craft workers. We were also talking to the project managers, the superintendents, uh, the contractors on site, um, you know, the subcontractors. So we, you know, we kind of had to cast a wide net. And, you know, the stories that we were gathering were, were super interesting, you know, stuff uh, like how, um, you know, people would say, hey, you know, there's just so many initiatives going on here that we're, you know, we are just having such a hard time, uh, you know, keeping up with what's going on. You know, they're throwing uh, stuff at us like, you know, hey, we got to do this lean project now. And, oh, we need to have a certain uh, uh, metric for sustainability that we have to meet. And, oh, we have this, you know, obviously COVID is a big deal. And now we have to manage that. And, you know, so we heard all kinds of interesting stories about how people were adapting and coping with all these stressors that, you know, were being thrown on them at the last minute. So that was interesting. Um, and then, you know, and, and, you know, you'd also hear stories about how you know, people were, were really happy with the project. I mean, one of the things that was so striking to me is, is how people would tell stories about, well, you know, the superintendent at this job site is doing a fantastic job. They work really well with my crew. And, and you dive in a little bit deeper. You know, it's not, you know, one of the things we really talk to our, our, the people on the team is how can we, you know, don't just take things at face value. Let's start to understand, you know, if we're having success, where is that success coming from? We don't want to just say, you know, hey, we're, everybody's good. It's all puppy dogs and ice cream. Let's move on with our lives. We want to understand, you know, what's driving this? Is success coming from a few individuals or is it becoming, is it coming from those, those success factors that we identified? Are we setting ourselves up for success or is it just happening because we have some good people in place? Um, and so we found things like, you know, one of the things is the superintendent makes it a, a, a goal to always go out and talk to craft workers. And so, you know, she would 
rather than just, uh, you know, go out and say, tell people, hey, you know, you need to do it this way. She made it a point of always going to them and explaining to them, here's, no, here's what I need from you. Um, what do you think? What are your concerns? Okay, good. And so it was very communicative. And that was, you know, it was really interesting how often people would point to that and tell stories about how that really helped make things go smoothly in the project. So we gathered all kinds of stories like that. Um, there's also some bad stories that we gathered, uh, you know, stories about how, you know, this particular organization has a commitment to zero. And um, this organization uh, in its commitment has become very punitive in its uh, response to accidents and incidents. And workers, for example, would talk about, um, I, you know, how that made them feel stupid. So after an incident would happen, they'd bring people in and, um, you know, the, the guys would say, yeah, they're just, we just feel dumb. <laughs> you know, they just, they just ask us these really stupid questions and make us feel like we don't know what we're doing. Um, I, we literally had one worker say to us, I will never report an accident here again, um, which I found fascinating. Um, but one of the things that was interesting is one of the workers said, uh, yeah, things were really bad up until the last incident. And, I, and we were like, oh, what happened on the last incident? Well, the last incident, we brought everybody together. And rather than doing our normal, you know, uh, root cause analysis kind of approach, they did a learning team. And so you could start to see how things were changing, um, you know, it, within the organization with some of the efforts. And that was another thing that we were able to capture in this assessment that I don't believe we would have captured otherwise. So anyways, after we gathered these stories, we brought together the whole team, including people from the project. And we just asked the question, what can this teach us about how this operating group and this project is setting ourselves up for success? Because the whole point of resilience is not that, you know, we just want to see that everything's going well today. We, what we're really asking is where is the resilience coming from? Because fundamentally, people are resilient, right? That's just a natural feature of humans. Um, and so, you know, when things are left to their own devices, you're going to get resilience. But the problem is if you're relying on, if you're, all your resilience is coming from a few individuals, um, you know, you, you have brittleness baked into your system because uh, you actually have no idea where that resilience is coming from. And when those people have a bad day, that's it, you're done, right? Um, and so we, we said, okay, let's identify where this, this resilience is coming from and see how can we sustain it, where we find it, where we find sources of brittleness, how can we shore those up and, and maybe add some resilience, add some capacity, and then what else, what else can we learn from the process? What, you know, what can we just learn from each other about what's going on and how things are working? And it was, it was amazing. The, the discussion we had, we, we did this over a whole day. So the morning we did kind of going out and talking to people. And then, and then the afternoon we spent time talking about what we found. And the conversation was, was amazing. You know? And one of the things that was so striking to people was how, how forward looking it all was. It wasn't about who screwed up or how you're not managing your project well, or even things like, hey, you know, you're doing amazing because you're a hero. I mean, those stories came out, but it was this focus always went back to, oh, that's great. How can we build on this? How can we move this forward and create more of this? How can we, how can we you know, find ways to, to make this happen in the next project? Um, what can we learn from this? Um, and so out, out of this process, uh, we, you know, one of the things that was amazing was people just felt so connected. You know, you had people from that sister projects who they learned something about their own project from this. You had people from the design team saying, oh man, I never knew <laughs> all this stuff was happening because they don't get to go out to job sites very often. Um, and so to me, I think one of the key lessons learned in all of this, uh, is, you know, and, and the, the process itself is, I think, interesting. And honestly, it's not that revolutionary. The process itself is fairly straightforward. It's something that you've probably been hearing about all day and well, I mean, well before that. You know, the process is, okay, how can we create something that brings people together so that we can talk to workers and learn from them and learn about what's going on? And, you know, bearing in mind that when we say worker, we do mean the frontline worker, but we also 
acknowledge that workers exist at all levels of the organization. So there are stories at every single level, right? So, so how can we talk to workers and learn from them, right? But the, the really, I think, innovative part that this organization did is they saw that not just as a novel thing to do, they saw it as a means to not only assess how they're doing, but identify ways to move forward. And this is the essence of what we, you know, we talk about is forward-looking accountability, at least the way I understand it, right? It's not about, you know, hey, let's hold people accountable because they screwed up and, you know, whatnot. It's about what do we need to do to get better? Let's figure out what's going on and find a way forward. And, and so this organization said, yeah, that's what we want to do. Let's figure out what's going on. And so what we're going to do now, the next steps in this is um, let's, we're not going to move it out to the whole operating group. We've tried it on a big project. Now we want to try it on a small project. And that's one of the, you know, other lessons learned in this is that, you know, we, we, we did find, we did find a few sort of uh, uh, opportunities to, um, you know, kind of improve the process a little bit, little tweaks here and there, ways to set up our teams for success, you know, uh, you know, kind of ways to prep them for the um, for their roles and whatnot. Um, and um, so, you know, when you do roll out a new innovation like this, one of the things I really recommend you do is to really lean on the idea of a pilot project. Um, you know, as you're, you know, I, I hopefully through this whole day, you all have come up with amazing ideas on things you can try and, and things you can you can do. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, my, my one piece of advice is don't just take it and roll it out to the whole organization. What I'd recommend you do is, is find, you know, find what you want to try and then go try it in, in a small place because that allows you to kind of, you know, fail fast, if you will, right, which is kind of the, the classic innovation model. Um, so you can, you can see where it's working and where it's not working and tweak it and then adjust it and go to the next place and try it, try it again and, you know, keep working on it, keep refining the process. Um, and so, you know, my, my, you know, overall advice to you all is, is, you know, think outside the box. Um, you know, the, the main thing I would applaud this organization for is just their ability to look beyond what was required of them. I mean, they're looking to replace their, their whole assessment process with just something that is just, it doesn't have numbers. It doesn't have um, you know, spreadsheets, it just has conversation, it has dialogue, it has, you know, a, just a facilitated process of bringing people together to talk about what's going on and asking what can we learn from that uh, and how can we improve moving forward. So that was all I really wanted to talk about, short and sweet. Um, I know we don't have a ton of time, but I, if there are questions, I don't, you know, I'm happy to answer them, but, uh, I hope uh, this at least gives you some things to think about and, and is uh, somewhat interesting for you. Thank you so much, Ron. Uh, lovely. So my f one immediate reflection that I've, 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 well, not just a reflection on, on, your, um, on your exposition, but a question that, of course, has come up, oh, perhaps even going back 10 years uh, uh, to that very first meeting that John Green also referenced. Um, should we be auditing at all? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I, I, I guess I would say it depends on what we mean by auditing, right? And so if we're in, in what we are auditing, right? Because there are some things where there could be a consistent standard that we need to apply to. And I'm thinking primarily of technical systems, you know, where you would need to look at something that's very linear in, in its operation and very straightforward and predictable. And those things, I think, would lend themselves to op, to a sort of an audit or an inspection sort of, sort of approach. Um, but then there are other things, you know, which, for example, the operation of an organization, the, um, the, the way an organization plans work, the way an organization learns from things like failure, um, these things I don't think lend themselves to audits. They, you know, because there's not a consistent standard or best practice that always works. There is a, you know, maybe a mindset that we could look for, but beyond that, it really needs to be contextual. Is sort of the way I would think about that. 
if you um, but if you take that position, let's go back to what Todd said, which is uh, we uh, we suck at learning. Um, and, and, and if anything, it's probably because it's really hard to demonstrate that you're learning or or uh, marking that somehow. Um, how would you convince leaders that the approach taken would yield uh, learning? Are there any examples from even your engagement last week that would suggest that learning has taken place? Yeah. So uh, to me, it's it's not about what you see in the moment. It's about moving forward, right? And so are we seeing people adjust their performance to what the information that they've been presented? You know what I mean? Like... But, uh, yeah, yeah. Back, back to uh, just, just, just. Uh, you know, back to uh, to Fred, Fred Charette's conversation. Uh, you know, th- this idea of moving forward is, of course, a, a very much an enlightenment idea, right? That <laughs> there's only one direction to go, and yeah. it always needs to improve. We somehow need to get better as humanity, yeah. um, which is cute. But again, it's 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 very culturally embedded in how we think in the West. But fair enough, I'll give you that. Well, and I would, so, I would, um, I would agree with that. And but I would say, you know, and, and moving forward makes it seem like it's always about improvement. But I think improvement, it has to be relative to the situation, because it's not like a linear graph that you always see upward movement. And, you know, I see improvement as a a sort of fitness with our environment, right? And sometimes improvement could be Mm. taking a step back. You know, sometimes Mm. improvement could be, you know, uh, uh, slowing down. And I think that's, you know, yeah, Having having fewer rules, having fewer, absolutely, absolutely. So, I mean, an interesting question came up, which is, I mean, I'll throw it at you right now because I think in, in the discussion that we had, um, and and, the, and again in your exposition, it would fit well. Um, so, somebody uh, heard somebody suggest uh, that we should perhaps add a, a line to a JSA that gets a work team to discuss the conditions that will pause work um, and and uh, and and reassess. The path going forward. Um, yeah. Ultimately, this is very much a question for Beth as well, and so I'm I'm, I'm rolling into the the broader discussion. But let me just do a process question here, Dave. Is that all right to 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 field this question now, or is this not a good time? Look, I think it'd be great to get Ron's perspective on that, and then we've got Jim talking, and then Beth and Ron and Jim are coming back together on a panel after after that. Let me just invite Ron's perspective on that relative to audits. And, and so if people, if people engage with the approach that you've suggested, Ron, and um, one of the knee jerks is, well, let's have another line on our checklist. Let's create another procedure or rule um, that responds uh, very visibly to the type of learning that we wish to engender. Um, what's the response? How do you respond to that? Uh, I would say, you, to me, fundamentally, the question has to come back to, is it actually improving work or is it improving our perception of the control of that work? And that's, mm-hmm. that, to me, is, is really the, the important question because too often, the touchdown. exactly, those line items that just make us feel better that, okay, we can have a standard process and there's accountability. And if it's written down, then we know it happened. Which is all nonsense, in my opinion. Um, you know, does it? You know, is that something that people who are doing the work say, "Yes, this is adding value. This is actually enabling us to do what we want to do," or do they think it's just a yep. box they have to check? Yep. The uh, th- and the final reflection, which goes back to a, a number of the discussion that we've uh, discussions that we have had, um, goes back to the 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 hysteresis in the system, the the uh, the path continuation that we're on. If anything, through sheer bureaucratic force and size and momentum and bureaucratic entrepreneurism, that the systems that have been set up around safety currently are so large, in part because they're so large, uh, and which means they, they essentially sustain themselves um, through, again, a, a, a moral bureaucratic undertaking. We're doing this for the betterment of humanity and for the not getting our workers to suffer. And we are desperately necessary. And if you, know, you throw us out, you get in trouble with the lawyers. Um, uh, and so let alone it would be morally uh, reprehensible to, to get rid of all of this bureaucracy. If you look at auditing as a bureaucratic self consistent system. Like Wittgenstein said about math at some point, you know, math is a language that's consistent only with itself. Mm. We've seen many situations in which safety auditing produces language and codings that are consistent only with itself, yeah. right? And have nothing to do with the world it portends to, to or, or it suggests or pretends to describe uh, or somehow capture. 
um, and there's a literature around this, right, as you know. Um, with auditing then being the microcosm, and in some sense the experimentable microcosm of uh, bureaucratic entrepreneurism that has the, the chief aim of sustaining itself, um, how, do we, how, do we take, how do we take some of the Jenga wood, pieces of wood out of that? I'm reminded of what Todd had next to him on the, on the desk um, <laughs> to, to start dismantling that. Yeah, I think, um, so one of the things that's really fascinated me lately thinking about this, this question is, okay, what's driving this? And I, and I get the sense that there's a deep anxiety in, in a lot of leaders and safety professionals that, that they're really trying to reconcile. And I think, you know, it was Eric Hallnagel who, who talked about kind of the dichotomy of like, okay, there's the desire to be safe and then there's the desire to feel safe. Right. And those two things are, are important goals, uh, but they can conflict with one another. Right. You know, you know setting aside just the, the simplicity of those statements. But like if we if we think about it that way and I see this a lot, uh, I was having a conversation with the leadership of that very organization later in the week about that. Like when you get that text message, for example, that, hey, we had a failure at the job site. How does that feel in that moment? What pops into your into your gut? It's it's a lot of anxiety that they're that they're feeling and they're having to reconcile and sometimes that people act to reconcile that with a sense of control, right? And I so we um yep yeah. you know, finish your sentence yeah so so I think one of the things we can do is help people understand that that is another goal that's trying that we're trying to manage and give yeah. people resources to help them manage it. And to show that this now, let's pick up on that because the question about that is actually related to safety professionals. What do they need in order to have those resources and capabilities to begin auditing like this, Ron? What do they need to possess? So I think one of the things is a bit of is, to, if I may say so, a bit of courage um, and courage to step, <laughs> to step outside yeah. of the the compliance mindset. So like I can speak as someone who is raised in the safety profession in the United States. I mean, I was never taught to think outside the box. I was always taught to think in the box. And so, you know, it was only, you know, when you start to look bigger picture and you start to put these things into the, the broader context of an organization that you start to realize what well, this is a whole big world out there that's outside of my compliance book, you know, that I need to look at and I need to enable people to help, you know, get work done. Um, and But the, it's a little bit scary to go outside that because now I, I can no longer just point to well, you know, why do you have to do it? Because that's what the book says, <laughs> you know, and here's where it says it, you know, it's black and white, you know. Um, now I have to say, well, you know, I think this might be good, but I don't know. What do you think? And that's, that's hard to negotiate. That's scary. So I think safety professionals need to have the courage, number one, to be able to say, I don't know. We're paid to have For the duration, though. Questions. Yeah. For the duration, could you do both? What I'm trying to suggest here is that, um, as somebody told me in, in, in oil and gas, right, as in what we'll do is we'll just simply create this numbers parking lot, right, because given the accountability mechanisms that we have in our industry, in our organization, uh, we, need to, we need to create this garbage, right? It needs to sit somewhere. People need to be able to look at it, even if they, it means nothing. They have no idea what they're looking at, but it needs to be there. In the meantime, once we got that done, we'll do that pour la beauté, la beauté du geste, right? For the beauty of the gesture, we'll do that. Mm -hmm. um, but then once we've, we've got that covered, we're going to do some interesting things. Yeah. Now, if we get this question from a safety professional who says, man, I'd love to do it this way, and you say, yeah, okay, well, you need courage to do it. Um, is it at all, or is this, am I just fantasizing? Is it possible to then say, all right, I'll, I'll do my 10 minute audit and do the paperwork, bang, get it over with, and now, right, for the gesture, and now we're going to do something interesting, actually you'll learn something of value. Mm -hmm. Uh, is that at all achievable, given what you've seen on the front line, or is that fantasy? No, that's actually a really good point, and I think it is, and, and, and I've and it is achievable because I've seen people do it, right? Um, but I think I think part of it right. is is being aware of, you know, okay, what what is it that we have to do? Because a lot of, and as you know from your own work and your own research, like there's a lot of stuff that we do in safety that we think is required, but if we actually go back and look, most of it is not. It's stuff we made up along the way. It's it's rituals in a lot of ways that we we hold on to about what is what we should do. And so if we take a step back and say, no, wait, what does it actually say we need to do? And let's make sure we do that because, you know, none of us wants to be lawbreakers. Um, you know, we have an obligation that we have to meet. 
And then, okay, once we have that, that should free up some space to be able to innovate and to be able to build. And even in some cases, I've seen, you know, organizations and, you know, even in my, my own work, you know, kind of taken those compliance uh, uh, things that we have to do and even build off those to do them in a more productive and generative way. So I think there, I would like, yeah, yeah. Well, I would like to take that and, and put it before Kim, because Kim, we haven't had the opportunity to, uh, to engage you on substance that much yet because you've been very much mediating other voices, which is, which is good. And, and, and personally, I really appreciate the way in which you've done that. But I know at the same time that you sit on an incredible wealth of experience of exactly the sorts of things that Dave is talking about and the question that we were discussing. Tell us about how you were able to engender courage in your previous organization to release some of this, this anal auditing that was going on before you came in. What did you have to do? Oh, Sydney. Well, it actually inspired me to go and write a thesis about it, which I haven't quite finished, yeah, but I'm looking... Yeah, I haven't seen yet. So. I know, I know. Ah. Very, very soon. What's the status of that, girl? Ah. <laughs> Almost done. Look forward to sharing those recommendations with you, though. Um, yeah, how do you engender the, uh, the... How do you get the courage to go and have these tough conversations to remove this clutter that the, uh, the front line are just crying out to have removed? So uh, what I did, uh, what I have done and what I found has worked well, Sid, is uh, really challenge the, challenging the executives and the board and helping them uncover their core assumptions about what they think about zero, about safety, about the people that they hire in their organisation. What are their core values and assumptions that they probably don't really even think about consciously, right? So surface them up and then start to really challenge them and uh, draw heavily on the research. Many of the great papers that you've, you've published, um, Sydney, uh, a lot of the great books and the vast body of research that we have out there, put that in late, you know, you know read it, synthesize it, put it in layman's terms and take it to them and start to you present it to them because they're smart, intelligent people, right? So they can understand this when you give it to them. Um, and, and just get them thinking about really, you know, look at all this time and money and energy and resources we're spending. Is it really helping our organisations? Is it helping the bottom line, which they're interested in? And is it helping the safety of the frontline worker? And I find that that probably gives a, almost like an ironclad argument for, um, for the board, uh, you know, to take to the board and to the executives that's very, very hard to refute. And then, of course, they'll ask, well, if you're taking stuff away, what will be there in return? So if you take away LTIFR and TRIFA, uh, what are you going to give us, in, you know, instead? So you need to be ready um, and armed with, well, presenting with them um, perhaps new tools and methodologies and frameworks to give them the information that they need to fulfil their due diligence. So... Uh, Mm. Yeah, so but Sid, uh, Ron made a point before about doing a pilot. I think that's one way to do it. Or you could just go all in, right? <laughs> go all in. Take that. <laughs> that would be more my style. Just get in there and do it. Um, but I mean, that's that's contextual, right? So doing pilots may not be a yeah. bad idea either. Mm. That's good. That's good. No, as as as, uh, as John again said, rather than uh, no longer doing these numbers, uh, can we somehow dim the light on them and increase the light on other things, uh, which which is sort of the gradual uh, process that is not you know the way I would want to do things either, Kim. By the way, so um, <laughs> but you're right. It context context is king, right? It depends on what your opportunities. Uh, and, and, and possibilities really are given what you're facing. Uh, and you don't want to sort of discover that after the fact when, when you've been unsuccessful and, and helped out of the organization uh, because you were too radical, um, which is one reason why I've never been employed in a real organization because I wouldn't last half a day probably, right? So, um, but that's all right. There is a place yet. Um, uh, Ron, I really appreciate your contribution today, and it is wonderful to see how, uh, within uh, the years that we've known each other, um, you, um, you, you, you've not only developed in, into a really sophisticated, deep thinker in this space, uh, but with an ability to, um, to non-threateningly and uh, engagingly um, approach uh, both workers and leaders in conversations that shift the dial in a very practical way. And... Uh, Keep at it, my man, because um, it's people like you that make it happen. So my, my personal appreciation also on behalf of uh, the many people on the call. Uh, Dave, I shall loop back to you, my friend. Thank you, Sydney. Uh, and, and thanks for me also, Ron. I think we've heard the saying, stop investigating and start learning. And I think we can add to that now, maybe stop auditing and start learning too. And I'm going to take a saying that you uh, left us there with, Ron, which is like, are we about improving work or are we about improving our perception of the control of work? And I think that's, uh, that really fits nicely into 
what is our object of interest? If, if our object of interest is work as imagined, then by all means audit your organization and answer the question, is it compliant? But if our object of interest is work as done, then audit isn't the thing we need to do. We need to engage with work and workers in real time about what they're doing. And then, and only then, can we answer the question, is it safe? Um, together with the people who know about the work and the issues that they're being faced with.